Hello, welcome. This is the next uh, instalment of the Teardrop Ride. I'm actually at the park in uh, Crookville at the moment, and as you'll see at the beginning of the footage, I'm changing cameras and fitting them out with the cameras to get the new camera onto the screen and then setting off on the um, road to Lagan. I'll go through Lagan and then continue on towards Teralga in this uh, clip. We won't get to Teralga yet, but we'll continue in that direction. You'll see that for the most part the road is in pretty good condition. It's uh, well marked, it has some um, lines down the middle where necessary. There are uh, there's guideposts on the side, and in some places there even is a good, a good shoulder. So I'll leave you to enjoy this scenery, and I'm going to talk about uh, today's subject, which is the subject of Gladys Berejiklian, who is, was the Premier of New South Wales. And in order to do that, I'm going to read an article that was published in the Sydney Morning Herald this morning. Now, before I read it, I want, you to, I want to tell you who the writer was. The writer was a person named Anthony Wheely, who is a former New South Wales Supreme Court judge and former Assistant Commissioner of ICAC. It's the Independent Commission Against Corruption. He is currently the chair of the Centre for Public Integrity. And this is the article. The headline reads, Serious Questions, Much at Stake as ICAC Probes Berejiklian's Assertions. The revelation last year that the former Premier was in a close personal relationship with Daryl Maguire came as a shock to her colleagues and to the general public. In the immediate aftermath, Gladys Berejiklian, in a round of cleverly managed media events, was able to turn a possible political crisis into a high-level support for a woman who had been wronged by a dodgy boyfriend. However, it is inevitable, having regard for Maguire's manifest list of inappropriate dealings, that the Independent Commission Against Corruption would be obliged to scrutinise the relationship and her dealings with him. After all, she was the Premier, and indeed her relationship with Maguire spanned the years when she was the Treasurer and he was a Parliamentary Secretary. He continued after he was forced to resign from Parliament. It came as no real surprise when ICAC announced it would hold a public hearing to investigate the issues relating to the former Premier's relationship with Maguire. It became apparent that over many months the Commission had been seeking a large number of documents, interviewing witnesses and holding private compulsory hearings, indeed one with the Premier herself. Over the last fortnight, the, Commissioner has, the Commission has methodically and publicly laid out its areas of concern. First, did Berejiklian's failure to disclose her relationship with Maguire during the processing of two Wagga grants constitute a substantial breach of the Code of Conduct? Second, did she conceal Maguire's corrupt activities or act in a way that encouraged or allowed those activities? Third, did her behaviour constitute a breach of the public trust? On Friday and Monday, the former Premier, who was represented by two of Australia's leading barristers, was given an opportunity to state her position. In relation to the Code of Conduct, she fiercely maintained there was no conflict. Maguire's relationship with her was not of sufficient status to warrant disclosure. Moreover, her activities in relation to the grants provided no private benefit to Maguire or herself. She argued that the grants were for the good of the Wagga community, and that her decisions and actions were driven entirely by considerations of public interest. Her relationship with Maguire played no part in those decisions. Any fixing that she did for Maguire was precisely what she would have done and did for other members of Parliament. Against this background, Council assisting probed and tested these assertions through a lengthy series of intercepts and other material, much of which has been extensively published and dissected in the media. In particular, a serious issue arose in relation to the intercepts following Maguire's summons to appear before the Commission in July 2018. Council tested whether Berejiklian failed in her duty to report the information she had gleaned from Maguire about his private dealings. She argued she would have reported information to the ICAC, but did not believe she had any worthwhile material. She repeated that she believed Maguire when he claimed that he had not been involved in wrongdoing. Most, if not all, of Berejiklian's colleagues, ministers, bureaucrats, staffers, resolutely stated that she should have revealed the relationship with Maguire and should have recused herself from any part in the grants process. Berejiklian strongly disagreed. It was, she said, for her and not for others to decide whether there was a conflict, and she was perfectly satisfied that she was not in a position of conflict. She dismissed the suggestions that proper process had not been followed and maintained that she trusted Maguire and 
When he told her there was nothing inappropriate in his actions, she accepted this and was unaware of his extensive private dealings. At the end of the investigation, probably many months hence, it will be a matter for ICAT to determine whether it accepts or rejects the propositions raised by Berejiklian and her team of lawyers. No doubt her own words or utterances together with Maguire's chat through the lengthy intercepts are likely to play an important part in the outcome. There are, however, some significant points to be made even at this stage. The Ministerial Code of Conduct is a formidable document. Mike Baird, in conjunction with ICAC, introduced it in 2014 to usher in a new era of ministerial probity and integrity. At its heart is a necessity for ministers to avoid conflicts of interest, not only actual, but also the perception of conflicts of interest. A substantial breach of the code may constitute corrupt conduct within the meaning of the ICAC legislation. There is much at stake here. What then do we expect of our ministers? In what situation will their undisclosed interests raise real questions of integrity and probity? It is, simply, is it simply sufficient for a minister to say, I don't think this is a conflict here, so I won't inform the Premier? What if I am the Premier? Does the code even apply to me or am I in some way above it? Does it really matter and do we as a community have better things to do with our time than worry about abstract issues of integrity? The answers to these questions are not without difficulty. However, I believe the community should care and does care about ministerial and parliamentary integrity. Generally, our trust in politicians is at a low ebb. We know that frequently decisions are made and discretions exercised involving millions of dollars of public money. Surely it can never be right that decisions of this kind are made to please your mates, to reward your donors or simply to defeat your opponents. And by what standards does a minister determine for himself that he is not in a position of conflict when he must know that, were he to reveal that relationship, his senior colleagues would insist he step aside from any significant decisions involving that person. We can be very poor judges in our own cause, and it may be that Berit Jiklin is no better than the rest of us in this regard. It is difficult to understand why Berit Jiklin, shrewd and diligent as she is, apparently turned a blind eye to the inevitable perception of conflict in her continuing assistance to Maguire's electoral pursuits. Everybody else can see it. Why couldn't she? It is a manifest breach of the Code of Conduct for a Minister to knowingly conceal a potential conflict from the Premier. Surely, it would have been a simple matter for Berejiklian to have a private discussion with the Premier, Baird, and tell him of her relationship and take guidance and counsel as to whether she should take part in discussions affecting the Wagga electorate. It would have been such a simple step to take and would have avoided the controversy and perhaps made it unnecessary for the Premier to resign. These are serious questions and they go to the heart of ministerial integrity and probity. The final observation, despite the usual attacks being made on ICAC's role as the guardian of integrity, this has been a very well controlled public hearing. It has been moderate, cautious and careful. Both the Commission and Council assisting have taken great care to avoid it becoming a trial by media. Indeed, it is not a trial at all. It is a continuing investigation with procedural fairness well on display. The Commission is to be commended for its respectful way it has conducted itself. Those who continue to criticise it are those who don't wish to see integrity sustained at the highest levels of government. Now I repeat, that article was written by Anthony Weeney, a former New South Wales Supreme Court judge and former Assistant Commissioner of the ICAC. So he, you would assume, knows a thing or two about uh, what constitutes corruption, what doesn't constitute corruption, and knows a thing or two about what constitutes inappropriate uh, behaviour by a politician. Now, I acknowledge that politicians are fair game for criticism many times. I also acknowledge that many politicians are probably honest, decent, hard-working people who do the right thing and do what is expected of them. The issue at stake here is simply this. Ought we not to expect that our politicians um, act in an honest, open manner and behave with integrity. Remember that politicians are the people who pass the laws that tell you how you should live. Do not murder, do not steal, do not take drugs, do not sexually harass people, do not be a cyber bully, and so on and so forth. All of those laws tell you how you must live your life. Ignorance of the law is not an excuse for not obeying the law, 
and there are all sorts of punishments that can accrue for not obeying a law, from simple fines to prison sentences. Now, I spoke yesterday about some laws, such as the Truth in Advertising law, that um, politicians exempt themselves from. And they may argue that well, we need to do that in order to do, our job, to do our job, and that is one issue. But the issue of whether they should be honest and act with integrity is entirely different. If we cannot believe or do not have the faith that a person we've elected to Parliament is acting in the best interests of the state or the best interests of their electorate and doing what they are required to do to represent their electorate in the best way they possibly can, but rather they're acting because of some secret relationship they have with the person or because of some person who's donated money to their campaign, then we have lost faith in our government. Now, the second issue that's at stake here is, again, a simple matter. When the government, be it the federal government, the state government, or even the local council, when they say, we are going to spend an amount of money to do this thing, whatever the thing is that they're going to do, they're spending your money. Your money that you pay in rates, your money that you pay in taxes and charges. You give that money to the government because you're required by law to pay rates for your council, you're required by law to pay a GST, you're required by law to pay income taxes and motor vehicle registration tax and fuel tax and cigarette tax and alcohol tax and all those sort of things. You are required to pay those things and you pay them because you want the government to do things like provide schools, hospitals, fix roads, employ doctors, employ teachers, employ nurses or whatever it is that you want them to do. When the government spends your money, don't you want them to spend it in the best way that they can? And by that I mean, first of all, if they decide that they're going to build something or do something in a community, that the community actually needs that thing, rather than just saying, we're going to build something here because it'll look like we're doing something and we'll get some votes, whether the community needs it or not. Secondly, that the, the need of that community has been established as being more important and greater than the need of another community who may be asking for the same thing or for some other thing. In other words, it's decided on the merit of the um, proposal rather than the electoral chances of, if we build this thing, we'll get some votes. The other thing, of course, is to say that when the government awards a contract and decides that they're going to build a thing or do a thing, give some money to somebody, that they have gone through a process to determine that the money that they spent, uh, spend is going to be spent in the best possible way. And that doesn't mean getting necessarily the cheapest quote. Sometimes they, want, they invite people to tend to the business and say, well, we didn't get the cheapest quote because the bloke who tended the cheapest quote, he's not very good at what he does. And there have been lots of complaints about his or her work in the past. So we went with someone who was a bit dearer, but their work is better quality. They do things on time. They provide a good finish. They provide good service and they get the job done without problems. So we spend a bit more money, but in the process, we're going to get a better product. Now, in the case of these various projects totaling something like $35 million to the electorate of Wagga, um, Daryl Maguire, as the local member, is obliged to, mem to lobby the Premier, the Treasurer, and anybody else who's got money and say, my electorate needs one of these things, and I'd like you to give me some money or give, give the electorate some money so this thing can be built. Um, the relevant minister or the premier or whatever is required to say, well, all right, you've made a submission. You've said your electorate needs this, but I have these other submissions from other electorates who also say they need one of those things or they need something else. And I've established a committee or a body or an organisation to assess all of these applications and put them in order from the most needy to the least needy and the ones that merit the most to the ones with the least amount of merit and I will follow their recommendations. If the person with the bucket of money is in a relationship with the person who's asking for the bucket of money, even if both of those people are members of parliament, or not, everybody else that's involved in deciding where that money goes know that those two people are in a relationship and that might influence the de outcome of the decision. Bearing in mind, of course, that Gladys Berejiklian was at one point the treasurer of New South Wales and therefore was the head of what was called the Expenditure Review Committee that went through all the expenditure and decided, well, we're going to spend money on this and this and this, but we're not going to spend money on that thing. Um, 
while she was making those decisions and while she was deciding to give money to things in the Wagga electorate, she was in a relationship with this bloke. Now, she says the relationship wasn't that important that she felt she should declare it, but she told radio interviewers after it was revealed this interview, after this relationship was revealed, she told radio interviewers that she thought she was in love with him, they had discussed marriage, they discussed children. She gave this gentleman a, a key to her house, and so obviously he was a frequent visitor. So this was not a case of a bloke you meet up with for coffee every couple of weeks and just have a catch up and have a whinge about your job or something. This is a bloke that you're in a close, intimate relationship with, uh, and you are then making decisions on uh, applications that he's making for grants of money for things to be money to be spent in his electorate. There is clearly a conflict of interest there. There was a requirement of the ministerial code that she reveal that conflict of interest, and she didn't do so. Now, <clears throat> whether you, uh, the, it remains for ICAC to decide whether that is or isn't a breach of the public trust or a failure on her part and therefore a breach of the ministerial code. But those are the facts as I understand and those are the facts as uh, that article has laid out. Um, so I guess we'll have to wait and see how it all plays out and what decisions have come to, uh, ICAC comes to in relation to this matter. But I think it's more than a case of just a poor woman. And bearing in mind this is a woman in her 50s who is a mature, experienced woman that's been around politics for a long time. She's not some 20-year-old um, fresh out of university, doesn't know what she's doing type. She's been around the block a few times. She knows what she's doing. Um, I don't think we can get away with saying well, she's just a poor, uh, misunderstood woman who's been caught up by a dodgy boyfriend or some bloke she's met on a dating site and he's played it for a mug and she's now in the position that she's in. All right, well, that's my view on the Gladys Berejiklian situation. So thank you for listening. If you have any opinion or any feedback, please feel free to offer it either in the uh, Facebook posting of this or uh, in the YouTube posting. Um, I hope you enjoyed the scenery. The next clip will take us further along the road from on the, along the Tralga Road, possibly into the village of Tralga, and I'll talk to you more when I get to that point. So thank you for watching, and I hope to speak to you again soon.